Room by Room's Matt and Sherry demonstrate how many decorating ideas can be used again and again in your home with a simple change of theme. At 9.30, Design at 9 continues when Decorating Sense shows you how to spiff up your home office for under $500. At 10 on Kitchen Design, a small cottage kitchen is given a 90s look while keeping the original charm. And at 10.30 on Vacation Living, visit the stylish Art Deco District of South Beach in Miami, Florida. It's all tonight on HGTV Home and Garden Television. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton, the house doctor. Welcome once again to The House Doctor, the show that helps you fix up your home or apartment. Now on today's program, I'm going to build a redwood bench around a backyard tree, and I'll give you some safety tips for operating your lawnmower. But first, when a viewer wrote wanting some help in building some slide-out shelves for kitchen storage, well, I paid her a house call. Ron, I was wondering if you could do something with my cupboard. I well, they're underutilized, for one thing. You need to put more things in here. <laughs> well, I'm trying, but actually I'm running out of room here. Uh, I seem to have stuffed a lot of things in here, but I can't access the back. And when I do need something, I pull everything out, and then I find it, put it back in. And I need something that is a little more accessible, that I can get to at easy hand. Um, and I need some ideas. Okay. Well, this is Janet, and you probably can relate to her problem here. I said, no, I certainly can. I've always got shelves that I just can't use because they're too deep, and I can't get to the stuff in the back. Or what if I do, I've got to take everything in the front out. So I, I've got an idea here. I think what I want to do for you is to make up sort of a sliding tray. Uh, that will actually pull out, hopefully, almost completely the depth of the shelf. That way you can get to this stuff and uh, you won't have to uh, go to a lot of trouble to use it. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to go out in the garage and start laying out some materials. Why don't, if you would, Jenna, go ahead and clear this uh, out for me. Okay. And so we can back in, we can go ahead and install this, okay? Wonderful. Well, as you can see, we're out here in the garage now and we're going to get started. Let me try to explain briefly what we're going to build here. Actually, I'm going to construct what is essentially a tray with some very uh, low sides on it. That's what will actually hold the things that are in the cabinet. And that tray, in turn, is going to be fitted with some drawer glides. I've got some here. These are metal drawer glides, just like the ones you'd have on a, um, a cabinet drawer. That's what's going to allow this tray to pull out and slide back in again. Now, by using several different kinds of materials on this project, the first one is this right here. This is going to be the drawer bottom or the tray bottom. It's actually three-quarter inch high-density particle board. You can see the particle board over here covered with a thin plastic called melamine. And the advantage of this is it's essentially pre-finished, so we won't have to paint this or put paper on it. It's got a good wear surface. It even has the melamine on the front edge here. If we were going to use this for a shelf, this will uh, all be covered, so we won't see that. Anyway, I've laid out the size of our bottom right here, made my measurements of the cabinet, transferred those to this material. And I'm going to cut this off. Now, you notice under here, we've got some wood to support this, so when I cut it, it won't fall. And also, I've clamped the straight edge right here, which will run against the saw base right here, guaranteeing us a straight cut. I've set the blade so it's just barely cutting through the material. And let's go ahead and make our cut. Well, here's our bottom cut to size. So, Jen, if you just sort of turn this around a little bit, the next thing we're going to do is put on the sides. Now, these are to keep the pots and pans or whatever from sliding off as you open and close this. This is a piece of one by three. This is poplar. You could use pine or, or any wood for this. Probably the soft wood would be best. And that's woodworking glue I just put on there. So, Janet, what I'd like you to do is to make sure this is flush on both ends okay. with the side of the, of the bottom and then it's flush on this side over here as well, okay? Let go of that now. We've got glue on there. We're gonna actually use some six penny finish nails here. They'll do two things. They'll actually hold this on too, but they also work kind of more as clamps while that glue is drying. So I'm gonna put about four of these in here. 
I've just been countersinking those finish nails that are holding these edge pieces on. So let's go ahead now and take a little bit of uh, wood filler, fill that up. Good. As you can see, we've got a, a tray here now, or maybe almost looks like a drawer. And you notice on this edge right here, this edging, I have actually extended that over uh, oh, almost an inch on both sides. I'll explain why in just a bit. But for the time being, this is finished. I want to go inside now and just double check the fit inside those cabinets. Well, here's our new drawer. Now this is gonna actually fit right up in here and it'll pull out. Of course, we're gonna to have to have some kind of a glide mechanism to allow this to come out and go back in again easily. So today, what I'm gonna be using is a metal glide and we're gonna take this apart. This comes in two sections. This part right here will eventually be mounted on the side of our drawer. And this side, this piece right here, mounts to the side of the cabinet. Now, if our cabinet had two sides, that is two ends, we could probably just mount these right to the inside of the cabinet by shimming out some right here with some uh, strips of wood so that this was mounted flush with the edge of the face frame right here. But over here, as you can see, we've got no end wall. So we're gonna have to construct something to take care of that. Because we don't have anything to attach those glides to on the right side, we're gonna make up here some sides and a false bottom. This will become a little clearer as we get a little further along in the project here. But this is a piece of 3 8 inch plywood on the bottom. And this will eventually sit right on top of that shelf. Okay, Janet, I put some glue on there. If you would just sort of position that again, flush with, flush with the edge and flush with the side. And here's your clamp. Just go ahead and clamp it in. We're gonna clamp these uh, on this side and then we'll flip them over and uh, attach this with some nails from the other side, but the clamps will hold everything in place here until we're ready to do our nailing. Now this is the frame that's gonna hold our drawer glide hardware. Let's call this, uh, it's called a chassis. And this of course is the drawer glide itself. Again, we're gonna separate this into two pieces. This part will eventually mount on the side of the drawer. This part right here is gonna mount on the side of our chassis. We'll line that front uh, edge of the glide with the front of the frame here. Slide this out, and then we'll attach this with some number six screws right through these pre-drilled holes in the drawer glide. Now this is the part of the drawer slide that goes on the side of the drawer. So we'll lay this right on here. I've drawn a line down here as a guide. Okay, and then we'll attach that with some more of these number six screws. Well, let's slip our drawer in now. And we've got a nice fit. All right. Now, take a look right here. Remember, we left this drawer front just a little bit long. Well, that's so it will cover up the uh, side right here and the hardware. And when this is closed now, we get a nice, clean, finished look. There is another slide system available for smaller cabinets like this. Its main disadvantage is that it won't carry as much weight, but it mounts right to the top of the shelf and the other part of it mounts to the bottom of the drawer. Now, once again, this gets separated into two sections I just pull apart and you simply mount this section right here to the drawer bottom. I've already drawn a line on there to indicate where this goes, and then secure it with some screws. Now, the other half of this slide, as I said, gets mounted to the shelf here. Get my glasses on. What's really important when you're putting this type of system in is that these two be exactly parallel. Actually, these are designed really for smaller drawers. And if you don't have them exactly parallel, and you put two of them in like this, then of course they will bind. All right, now take a look here. This is another way to get into a tight space if you have to with a flexible shaft right at the end of my drill here. We'll use that to install these screws. There's a half of the slide right here on top of the counter, the other half on the bottom of the drawer. Now, if I have measured carefully, everything should line up here. I'll slip this in here, engage those. Sometimes you gotta wiggle it a little bit to get it started the first time. There we go. And there you have it. Okay, Jan, I want you to go ahead and try this now, see how everything works. We've loaded this back up with uh, the appropriate amount of cookware. This is wonderful. All right, yeah, this is working really nicely. Now, regardless of what kind of uh, drawer glide system you use, the bottom mount or the side mount, you're gonna get a lot more usable space out of your cabinets. But one of the things I like about the side mount is this is what's called a full extension slide system. You notice the entire tray is out here in front of the cabinet where you can get to everything, even the stuff that's in yeah. the very back. The other one opened about two thirds to three quarters of the way. Also, this is very heavy duty. It'll take 100 pounds, so even if we were to load this up with canned goods, it's still gonna be strong enough to take the weight. So anyway, there you go. Um, 
you've got at least a couple of shelves that now you can use completely. It's great. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for having us over. Yes. It was a great project. Thank you. And if you want to get some more space out of those cabinets of yours, well, this is an idea you might want to try. Next, how to build a bench that surrounds a backyard tree and making sure your lawnmower is safe. It's a faucet. It's a filter. It's a faucet. It's a filter. Introducing the faucet with the water filter built right in. Faucet by Price Fister. Filter by Teledyne Water Pick. It reduces chlorine and odor, so all that's left is great taste for a fraction of the cost of bottled water. It's a faucet. It's a filter. It's both. The filter faucet from Price Fister. Tuesday, October 13th. To keep your unused terracotta pots from cracking this winter, clean them and store them indoors. Wash them with a solution of one part bleach to nine parts water. Scrub with a brush, rinse, let them dry, and store them inside. For smaller pots, just submerge denture cleaner tablets into a bucket of water. Soak the pots for five minutes and rinse. This lovely English walnut tree has a lot of shade to offer on a warm summer's day, and there's no better way to enjoy it than sitting on a bench that circles right around the trunk. Well, this is Eric. Hey, Eric, how you doing? Hey, Ron. It's Eric's house in Eric's backyard, and we've just finished building this bench. Let us show you how we did it. One of the first things you'll have to decide is how large your bench is going to be. Now, you can sort of think of it as a donut, and what you want to figure out is what's the diameter of that inside donut hole. Easy way to do that is to take a tape measure or a yardstick and measure across the tree at its widest point. That's usually going to be down near the ground. You can see we've got quite a bit of tree sticking out right here. So let's eyeball this. Looks like about uh, five feet to me. So that's going to be the inside diameter of the bench that we're building. Now, one way to support a bench is to sink posts into the ground, but these should be put into concrete and that can present a problem because the tree roots can simply be in the way. Now, often by relocating these and going through a process of trial and error, you can find a place to put them that won't involve hitting a tree root. One thing you don't want to do, though, is cut the roots and give your tree a real root ache, and in fact, it could kill it. The bench that we're building today is going to be a freestanding bench. It's simply going to sit on top of the ground. So let me show you how we're going to construct that. We got our design for this round the tree bench from a book on yard and garden furniture. What we're going to be doing is constructing six of these seat supports. Now these are going to be spaced equally around the tree. And then of course the seating will go on top and there'll be some more boards that'll form the back. First thing we want to do is cut out the back leg and the front leg from this piece of four by four over here. The blade on most circular saws is not large enough to cut all the way through a four by four in one pass. So you'll have to make at least two cuts. Here's how to do that accurately. Make your cut mark and then continue that line all the way around the 4x4 four four using a square. Next, make your first cut on the top of the board. Then flip the board over, and on that same line, make your second cut. For angle cuts, first set the proper bevel on your circular saw. Go ahead and make the top cut as you normally would. Then, using a straight edge, continue that cut across the board to the bottom edge. And using a square, then continue that line across the bottom of the board. Finally, make the second cut the same way you did the first. Next, we're going to cut a 30-degree bevel on what will be the upper part of the rear legs. Now, I'll explain this in more detail later, but basically, this is to allow the boards on the back of the bench to join and fit more smoothly. Now, this project requires making a number of repetitive angle cuts, so you might want to consider renting a power miter saw. That'll give you nice, clean angles through wood that's, say, up to one and a half or two inches thick. If you're going to stain or seal your bench, and I would recommend that you do that, it's easier if you'll do that staining before you assemble. 
What we're using today is a clear sealer stain, and it actually has an ultraviolet filter in it. At the bottom of the legs, where there'll be direct soil wood contact, we'll paint some copper naphthenate wood preservative. We've cut out all the pieces for our bench frame right here, the front leg, back leg, the seat brace, and the lower brace. I'm going to uh, just assemble these now, making sure that the angles are all correct. And then we'll attach these together using a rust-proof deck screw. Okay, for our bench seat, we're going to use these two by six planks. And on the end right here, we've cut a 30 degree miter. Why 30 degrees? Well, this is a circular bench, 360 degrees all the way around. There are six joints like this of 60 degrees each, and half of 60 is 30. Now, we've got a choice to make right here. We could simply butt these two up end to end. I mean, the angles are accurate enough to do that, have a nice clean joint like this. But the problem with outdoor furniture is that it does shrink and expand, and over time, any miter will tend to open up something like this. So what we're going to do is intentionally separate this by, oh, about an eighth of an inch or so. And to make this look like it's intentional, we're going to round over this sharp edge right here using a belt sander. It's time to start assembling the components of our bench now. Uh, we're going to begin by putting down the seat boards. Eric, if you can kind of hold that in place. Now, over here, what we want to do is center this board, or the, put the end of this board just about in the center of this opening. I'll use a combination square to check the distance here. It looks pretty good, front to back. Now, to attach this, I'm going to be using a 3-inch uh, rust-proof deck screw. This has got a self-drilling tip on it. Put it in our bit holder right here. And we'll put about two of these for each deck board. As you can see, we've installed four of the six sections around the tree here, kind of gotten them into position. Now we're going to tie these two together with the remaining seat planks. We'll put them in place just like this, and then we'll secure them in place using these galvanized three-inch screws. Now, it's best to put the backboards in after the base has been installed and screwed together. Remember we cut that 30-degree chamfer or bevel on this back leg earlier? Well, this is what it's for, so that the back planks have a surface to which they can be attached. Again, we're going to leave our small reveal right here, and we'll attach these also with the rust-proof screws. Well, sir, I think we're ready to light off the Barbie here. This turned out very, very nicely. And take a look at this uh, detail down here. See, we intentionally left this gap where these boards come together, remember, so they wouldn't sort of end up as open-looking miters. Adds a very attractive detail to the bench. What did we end up spending on materials for this? It was a right, right around $320. Okay. As far as maintenance, uh, I'd suggest that about once a year, just reapply a coat of that sealer, and that should keep it looking nice like this. Now, every time you do a project, you learn something. And what I learned from this is next time, I would assemble this entire bench on a flat surface, like a garage or a driveway. Then take it apart into two halves, bring it out here, hook those two halves together, and then either dig out or shim up underneath the legs until I got it level. But anyway, my friend, that was a very nice job. Uh, enjoy. You've got to give me a high five being high five. the basketball guy you are. <laughs> really, really nice job. And it's going to be the centerpiece for uh, many backyard parties, I'll bet. Next, tips and techniques for making your lawn mowing a safer experience. Want to add color to your backyard? Why not start with red? Nobody brings people and nature together, like Wild Birds Unlimited. How do you make the best seed even better? You have a seed sale. Nobody brings people and nature together, like Wild Birds Unlimited. Hi, I'm Cheryl of Wild Birds Unlimited in North Olmsted. Let our certified bird feeding specialists bring nature to you and your family. Attention used car buyers. Bob Morris's Big Lot in Cleveland is having a $99 sale starting right now. Regardless of the type of car you want, $99 down delivers. That's right, $99 down whether you want a Ford, Chrysler, or GM product, and you can drive away today. Quality cars from $49.95 through current models with only a few thousand miles, all for only $99 down. Every day, more people buy a used car from Bob Morris's Big Lot, State Road at I-480. In Cleveland. And don't forget to ask for my cookies. Ugh. For my everyday paint colors and combinations.
I didn't just pick the colors. I picked the colors that go with the colors you pick, and they're available at Sears and Kmart. You had no limits other than your imagination when you created the look for your home's landscaping. Why be limited now when choosing casual garden furniture? Most casual furniture brands limit you with one or two styles, but U.S. Leisure and Sun Terrace liberate you with a large variety of trend-setting looks. For casual furniture, choose U.S. Leisure and Sun Terrace. Fine products with one thing in common, affordability. So affordable, you'll want to stack up, uh, stock up. U.S. Leisure and Sun Terrace. On most Saturday nights since 1866, Texans head for a place called Green Dance Hall, Green, Texas. When the band sends a steamy summer night on its way, the place really cooks. But even temperatures up in the hundreds can't stop the two-steppers. Green's has a very reliable cooling system, cold beer, and Hutter ceiling fans. Hutter, building the best since 1886. At GEICO, we get the ball rolling on your claim quickly. Even in the middle of the night. GEICO, a 15-minute call could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Unfortunately, most drivers are hit in the same place every time. And it's usually when the car insurance bill arrives. GEICO, a 15-minute call could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Spreads like buttercream, covers like royal icing. My everyday paint colors and combinations make decorating a piece of cake. And they're available at Sears and at Kmart. Each year, tens of thousands of people are injured in lawnmower accidents, many of them children. So before you take that mower out the next time, keep these few safety tips in mind. Fuel your lawnmower before you start while the engine's cold. And if you have to refuel, give that engine time to cool down before you put in more gas. Remember, gas in contact with a hot engine can cause an explosion or fire. And be sure you store your fuel in a container approved for gasoline storage. Before you start mowing, check your lawn for debris. Objects like these can be picked up by the blade and hurled at speeds up to 200 miles an hour. And make sure children are nowhere around. In fact, the best idea is to have children inside and supervised by an adult. Inspect the mower blade. Of course, anytime you work on a mower, you always want to disconnect the spark plug wire first. Make sure the blade is sharp and check for any cracks, pieces that could fly off as the mower is operating. Also, inspect the shaft of the mower. If there's any string or debris twisted around it like there is right here, cut it away before you start mowing. To keep yourself safe from flying objects, wear eye protection long pants, and sturdy shoes. Modern mowers are equipped with an operator presence switch. If you should happen to slip and lose your grip, it shuts down the engine or stops the blade rotation. Now, it's very important never to disable this feature by tying or taping the switch to the handle. Stop the mower before crossing pavement or gravel. If the blade should strike concrete like this, it could send chips flying or shatter the blade itself. Never mow wet grass. It can easily clog the discharge chute and cause you to slip. Use extra caution when mowing slopes. Always mow across, never up and down. If the discharge chute does get clogged, never try to clear it with your hand. Instead, use a tool or a stick to do the job. You know, a lot of what I've been saying, I know seems like common sense. But the fact is, last year, over 90,000 people were treated in emergency rooms for lawnmower injuries. So, respect this tool and use it safely. Now, if I said clamp, you might think of something that looks like this. Or, perhaps a more updated version, something that looks like this one. But you probably wouldn't think of something that looks like this. Now, this is called a band clamp. It's actually an old tool. This is an updated version of it. Let's say, for example, we want to clamp this frame right here. We've got four miter joints. This can be a real tricky job with conventional clamps, but it's perfect for this tool. Now, this consists of a nylon strap or band and these four corner blocks right here. So what we're going to do is place these corner blocks on the corners. 
And this fourth corner block is sort of part of a tightening device. Now, once we have that in place, we'll loosen this cam right here, pull the strap or band tight, re-tighten the cam, and then just simply screw this up like this. Now, as we screw this, we begin to tighten everything up, giving us a perfect clamping job with uniform pressure on all four joints. Now, when it comes to clamping round or irregularly shaped objects, this band clamp really shines. Let's say we were rebuilding this uh, stool here. It was time to clamp the joints. We simply slip the band over the top. You notice I've taken off those corner blocks right now. We slip the band down here so that it lines up with the stretchers. Again, tighten the cam, and then just snug up the tightening device. Great, huh? Perfect for all kinds of furniture repair. It's called a band clamp, and you should be able to find it at most home improvement centers. Escape with HGTV's Vacation Living to the country's most beautiful vacation homes and hotspots. Discover your ideal home away from home. It's a house built for fun and partying and entertainment. Watch Vacation Living tonight at 1030 on HGTV. Volvos have always forced other cars to be safer. This one will force them to be better. The new Volvo S80. Nothing protects a metal roof like Cool Seal Aluminum Roof Coating. America's favorite do-it-yourself roof coating for over 50 years. A five-year performance Whoa. guarantee. Recommended for metal, asphalt, road roofing, and modified bitumen roofs. Whee! Cool Seal. It battles the weather and keeps your Great. Look for the red cool seal thermometer. Available at Lowe's. Nature's so bright, you're going to need shades. At Levelor, we're the first to make light of our shades. And you can color us any shade you want. Levelor, a lifetime made in the shade. Levelor, for all the shades of your life. Available at Lowe's and other fine home improvement centers nationwide. Safer than any car we've ever built. As thrilling as any car anyone's ever built. The new Volvo S80. How do you do? Have you seen the new 99 Pontiac Grand Ams at my son-in-law Bob's dealership? This week at Bob Morris Pontiac, lease a brand new 99 Grand Am for just $1.99 a month. Is that right, Bob? Yes, $1.99 a month for a 99 Grand Am at Bob Morris Pontiac. Are they stripped? No way. These cars have air conditioning, automatic, cassette, defogger, and much more for just $1.99 a month. Better hurry. To Bob Morris Pontiac, Center Ridge at the Turnpike Overpass. In North Ridgeville. And don't forget to ask for my cookies. One of the most popular and attractive features in any home is the fireplace. Homeowners, home buyers, and builders all agree. And in Northern Ohio, one store has earned a reputation as the leader in fireplace equipment and accessories. Country Stove and Patio in North Royalton. Discover a store where dozens of burning fireplace models and gas logs are displayed. Plus the largest selection of glass doors and accessories. Country Stove and Patio on Route 82 in North Royalton. partially used tubes of caulking compound you have lurking around your garage or basement that aren't any good any longer because they've dried out. Well, here's a tip that may help preserve their life just a little bit longer. Go to your electrical connector box and take out a wire nut and simply screw it on the end of the spout. Now, for most spouts, the gray size connector will be the best. If you've cut a small opening down here, then perhaps the red would work a little bit better. Now, please join me next time for more tips and suggestions to make your next home improvement job just a little bit easier. But right now, it's time to roll up your sleeves, get out there, and tackle some of those jobs that you may have been putting off. See you next time. Our apartment renovation project is ready to wrap up on this old house classics. Drop in and see how elegance and comfort create a charming and whimsical home tonight at 7 Eastern, only on HGTV.